Today on Timescast Tech, Apple and Samsung's patent battle goes to the jury. An app inspires community activism. Finding love face to face. We want the kind of user that doesn't want to sit in their bedroom behind a desktop computer to meet people. And privacy concerns with presidential election apps. Hey, welcome to Timescast Tech. I'm David Gillen. The Apple Samsung trial going on now in Silicon Valley is the biggest legal showdown in the tech world. Jury deliberation begins today, and how they decide in favor of Apple or Samsung could determine the look of tablets and how we use them in the future. My colleague Steve Lohr is here to discuss what's at stake. Hey, Steve. Hey, David. So just a quick recap here for folks. Uh, Apple is basically saying that Samsung uh, ripped off their patent designs and, and user interfaces. but but. Apple's got beef with a lot of companies in a lot of places. What makes this case, you know, so special? This is the highest profile case that we've seen so far, and Apple and Samsung are going at it in 50 suits and countersuits in 10 countries around the world. But this right. is in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's a jury trial, um, and there are uh, more deposition testimony that uh, has come out uh, in this and it gives you a glimpse inside the company than we've seen before. Okay, so I mean obviously the lawyers are loving this, <laughs> but, but break it down a little bit for us. I mean what happens if Apple wins? What happens if Samsung yeah, wins? The larger issue beyond the parsing of individual patents is that this is an opportunity in theory at least to sort of redraw the lines of competition in mm -hmm. what is arguably the most important and largest uh, tech market in the world. It's sm smartphones, tablets, and mobile. Um, so. Apple is, is basically, as we know, saying they're, you know, they're a copycat, um, and uh, Samsung is countersued in saying right. some of its telecommunications and communications uh, patents uh, Apple has violated. Okay, now you had a really interesting post uh, on the Times' Bits blog just the other day uh, in which one analyst was sort of wondering out loud if it might not be in Apple's self-interest to actually lose this one. I thought this was totally intriguing. What was he getting at? It's an interesting contrarian yeah. point. It was Steve Milanovic, who's a veteran uh -huh. uh, technology analyst now at UBS, and his point was that, uh, that Apple really doesn't have to fear the f followers, they mm. have to fear somebody coming out and doing something different. And if, in theory, at least, if Apple loses the case, this may force others to quote unquote think different. Yeah, and, I saw and, that phrase and, in the and, post. <laughs> and, do, and, and be more innovative. Yeah. Um, so whatever happens out in San Jose, I mean, I'm guessing that, you know, this is, we, we ain't seen the, the end of this kind of thing, right? I mean, the yeah. patent disputes are just going to go on and on. Unless the two sides settle, which is, mm. seems unlikely, uh, we're go this is going to run for a while yet. Yeah, I mean, we were just saying uh, uh, that it, it is somewhat unusual for something like this to actually go to trial, right? Yeah, and the big companies in the past in technology have typically had a lawsuit filed on each side, then they settle and cross-license among themselves as opposed to airing the innards of their companies in public. Right. Steve, thanks a lot. Sure. So we all know there are just thousands of apps out there. I mean, there's a running joke, basically, whatever you want, whatever you need, hey, there's probably an app for that. But jokes aside, apps are powerful tools, and the rest of our show will be taking a look at how some of them are changing the way we improve our neighborhoods, fall in love, and get involved in the presidential election. We begin in New Haven, Connecticut. This once concrete wall that divided people is now uh, a wall full of people that is creating interactions that never existed before. For years, the Humphrey Street underpass in New Haven, Connecticut was dimly lit, tagged with graffiti, and a place locals feared walking. In 2008, the blight caught the eye of local resident Ben Berkowitz. He and a few friends were in the midst of developing an online platform called C Click Fix, which would allow residents to report problems in their neighborhoods, like potholes or broken streetlights, to New Haven officials. So Berkowitz reported the situation on C Click Fix. Trees needed, it said, to lessen the unfriendly feel. Instead of the report being lost in bureaucracy, C Click Fix offered public documentation and accountability. As the website grew in popularity, the city of New Haven found the flood of crowdsourced information daunting, but believing in its mission, opted to order a customized version of the normally free service. When a, a pothole complaint comes in, um, it can automatically be fed into our work order system, um, which will change the status on C Click Fix, the public site, to acknowledged. And when we close it in our work order system, 
it will automatically change it to closed on the C-Click Fix uh, website. C-Click Fix, based in New Haven, has a staff of 14. The company now offers smartphone apps. Residents can use the app to click a photo of a problem and document its location using a smartphone's GPS. And large cities, Washington, D.C., Houston, and Minneapolis, have followed New Haven's lead. They've bought special versions of C-Click Fix and incorporated them into their 311 service. While other cities and towns offer ways for people to submit complaints via cell phone, and a company in the United Kingdom has a service similar to C-Click Fixes, the New Haven company has seen an unexpected surge of community activism as a result of their app. What's really interesting to us is that uh, right out of the gate, some of the first few issues were actually resolved by citizens, be it uh, removing graffiti on their own, uh, cleaning up a park, or transforming a highway underpass into a public art space. After Berkowitz's first post, a Yale University freshman posted a series of images documenting what he called the psychological division the underpass created. Almost immediately, people suggested a public art project. New Haven officials approved the idea and agreed to let Berkowitz and others hang large black and white photographs of people living in the area. The mural is an extension of French artist J.R.'s work, whose Inside Out project has spread similar photographs around the world. In New Haven, it has helped link an affluent neighborhood where many of Yale University's professors live with a working class section of town. It makes me feel good to see you know, people, all types of people you know, participating. People love seeing their faces on here. Like it just, it, 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 I feel like it brought the community together. I think these overpasses are, are much more than just uh, a way to get cars. They're actually concrete barriers to let neighbors talk to each other. And this project is bringing neighbors out of their houses and face-to-face and, and -face with one another. Staying true to the Inside Out project, volunteers hang the murals using wheat paste, a glue that cannot withstand the elements. Over time, rain destroys the photographs. One person has already filed a report on C-Click Fix. Ben Berkowitz has already put out a call, also on C-Click Fix, for a batch of wheat paste to repair rain-damaged photographs. But even if the posters wash away, the goal, he says, is to preserve the underpass as a public art space for other projects. So from community activism, we turn to love. For years, online dating services have promised to help people find that perfect partner using survey questions. But as my colleague Jenna Wortham writes in The Times, data exchanged over the internet can only go so far. So now, online dating services are hosting events offline, in bars to help people find love. One of these companies is called Meet Moi. Using mobile phone apps, it connects user users with each other based on their personal preferences and physical locations. I'm a nice person. I'm funny, I think. I, I could interact with a lot of people, but there are some people I'm not interested in interacting with, and all of them were on online dating, and they all found me. After one year of online dating, 27-year-old Kelly Bruce is giving up. Hi, are you here for the Meet My event? Yeah, yeah. Sort of. Great. So you have your drink ticket. Yes. Um, and then did you enter the promo code incorrectly? Yeah, Brooklyn. Okay. Miss Bruce is at a singles event in Brooklyn, organized by Meet Moi, a mobile application that turns a cell phone into a matchmaker. <laughs> oh my god, so perfect. So you can get your free drink, and then while you're here, you're going to get a bunch of introductions. Okay. After a quick download, Meet Moi uses GPS technology to track a user's location and send a notification if a potential match is nearby. Still, nothing beats a real-life get-together, so the company is hosting a party. I've been to Whistler before. Really? Yeah, but not since I was like 14. Okay. Meet Moi connects people at the event based on mutual matching criteria. So people express their preferences and we put them together because they, ha they, sh they should be interested in each other. So this is, takes online like one step further and it goes from, oh, his picture is cute to I see him across the room and I feel something. It's been about three hours and I've met five girls so far. Um, been rather picky, I'll be honest. <laughs> Education level, college. You've already done the legwork to know that, okay, the people at this event are looking for the same things that I am, and they understand that you can pretty quickly just say yes or no, just like on the app. Other dating services have been getting in on offline matchmaking too. 
Match.com hosts STIR events, and OkCupid will hold more than 100 singles events this year alone. While OkCupid's online service is free, it does charge about $20 to attend a singles event, which also brings business to local bars. The parties also build online business. Events are great for us for getting new users and getting visibility. I came here today because I was walking by, it's one of my favorite bars, and I just went in to enjoy a drink and sit in the sit outside, do a little reading, do a little writing, and I saw they were having this event, so I decided to stick around because, you know what, it wouldn't hurt to try. We attract the kind of users that we really want when we throw events. We want the kind of user that doesn't want to sit in their bedroom behind a desktop computer to meet people. Meme is used when people are out and about, so we want people with active social lives who are just looking to make those social lives better. When you're in person, you just have to be you. And it's so much more refreshing, it's so much more human. My phone's dead though. I, the ironic part is I got here and my phone had like 2%. Oh well. <laughs> Meeting in a bar. That's innovation. <laughs> so moving on, the Republican National Convention begins this coming Monday in Tampa, Florida, and the Democratic Convention is the following week in Charlotte, North Carolina. As teams of workers prep the convention halls and politicians polish their speeches, you might be considering downloading President Obama or Mitt Romney's respective apps. But the apps have raised concerns over privacy and how the campaigns are using the apps to win votes and raise money. Joining me is Lior Strahilovich, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School, and he's here to discuss. Hey, Lior, how you doing? Can you hear me, Lior? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Hey, first, just a, just a quick bit of disclosure uh, first, because uh, you overlapped briefly uh, with Obama when he was at Chicago Law. Did you guys uh, teach together? Uh, no, I wish, I wish we had. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, he, uh, he was a really well-beloved well teacher here, but uh, uh, he and I were at best casual acquaintances. Okay, great. So we'll get back to the apps then. So, you know, considering the explosive growth of uh, uh, mobile devices and our seemingly insatiable appetite uh, for apps, it's kind of no wonder that both of these campaigns are turning to apps uh, to get their messages out. I'm wondering, though... Um, you know, if you could give us a quick side-by-side -side comparison here, I mean, how are these things working? Sure. Uh, I'll start with the Romney app. Uh, the Romney app is terrible. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really do what it promised to do, which okay. was announce the Romney VP selection of Paul Ryan to the masses. All right. Uh, I think the information about um, uh, the Ryan pick showed up hours and hours after it was reported by the mainstream media. So although it built itself as an app for supporters to find out as, as, as soon as anyone who would be the VP pick, uh, it failed to deliver on that promise. Now what the app is doing though, uh, beyond uh, providing people with stale information about who's been the vice presidential selection, is it's uh, tapping users into links that will allow them to follow the campaign on Twitter, Facebook, uh, or uh, giving them links to contribute to the Obama campaign if they, or sorry, excuse me, to the Romney campaign if they so choose. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a really interesting profile just done on both apps by Randall Griffith at GFI Labs just a few days ago. And he was looking at the software embedded in the apps right. and looking at the permissions that the Romney app and the Obama app give um, to the campaigns, essentially, to the software developers. And what's interesting about the Romney app is it's collecting location information if you let it. It's connecting information about your contacts it, from your iPhone. Uh, it's also enabling the campaign to access voice recording or video recording on your phone, although the app doesn't appear to be using those capabilities at the moment. Right. Hey, uh, on the whole, the app doesn't provide a whole lot more other than those links and some fine pictures of the candidates. Okay. So it's really not innovating in any appreciable way. Lior, let me ask you, uh, you know, let, let me ask I, you. Should I talk about the Obama app? Yeah, but let, let me, we'll come back to that quickly because this, sure. what you just brought up here is, is, is really interesting. I mean, I'm giving up a lot then uh, of my information to the campaigns, uh, you know, when, uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm downloading and signing up for them. But there is nothing, there's nothing illegal about this, right? I mean, it, it may seem a bit invasive, but it's perfectly fine. That's right. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, I don't. I don't see any illegality in either of the applications with respect to this information that you're giving up when you install the application. You're essentially agreeing to a contract, mm -hmm. and that contract 
gives your permission to all these various things. So when you install the Ether app for the first time, you'll see a lot of legal boilerplate. Mm -hmm. And users who are concerned about those privacy, their privacy should read it, because you are indeed giving away a lot of information about yourselves. And if you log in through Facebook, you're giving up a lot of information about your friends as well. Right. I mean, the lesson here for users is pretty much that it's their responsibility to know what apps on mobile devices are doing and so forth. Uh, let's go back to the, uh, to the Obama app then quickly. Give me a quick rundown about that one. Sure. Well, the Obama app is uh, much slicker, uh, more attractive, and it has a lot more capabilities than the Romney app does. So it does some of the same stuff that the Romney app does, allows the application developers to access your geolocation, your contact list, etc. But it's pushing a lot more interactivity onto users who download the app. So for example, let's say you're interested in participating in a phone bank. The Obama app is going to use your geolocation to point you to the closest phone banking opportunities, the closest meetups, the closest trainings if you want to be a canvasser. And perhaps most controversially, the Obama application is allowing individuals just using their iPhones or their uh, other smartphones to identify nearby Democrats who they can speak to, canvas, on behalf of the Obama campaign. So it'll give you a script. Uh, it'll show you uh, in real time a list of, say, a dozen or two dozen nearby Democrats. It'll give you their first names, their addresses, their age, and their gender. And then we'll encourage you to go talk to them. And then after you do, uh, it'll ask you to phone home, essentially to provide details about your interaction such that you can inform the campaign as to whether they're charged up and uh, ready, to, ready to vote in November. Lior, thanks a lot. Fascinating stuff. Thank you. So one note before we go, Timescast Tech will be on hiatus next Wednesday and the following. We're giving up our regular show that so that our political team can bring you great coverage during the Republican and Democratic conventions. That's our show. Thanks for watching.